Hey everyone, welcome back to the lab. In this video, we're gonna be talking about how to write simple tests that scale with code bases, organizations, and changing requirements. So this will be a little bit of a long one, um, but I think this is like so, so important. Um, and so I have a lot of thoughts on this. And so, you know, testing is a chronic pain point and target of discussion and software engineering. It's just a core part of the job. A lot of your time is gonna be spent on testing, reading tests, writing new tests, changing test cases, you know, that's just a kind of core component of software engineering. And I, I've recently been in another round of discussions about like how to write tests for large systems at work and best practices for our team, best practices for other orgs, things like this. And here I wanted to share some of like the thoughts um, to kind of spread the discussion and battle harden some of these ideas. You know, there's like no right way to do things, but there's often like better ways of approaching common problems. And so, you know, what works maybe in isolation may not work broader. And really the only way we can come to a consensus on this stuff is to like keep discussing it and seeing what works um, across a lot of scenarios. And so, you know, I'm personally think I'm like pretty lax on most coding philosophies. I don't really like, not like a zealot on a lot of things. Basically, if what you wrote is a simple scalable system that solves the problem at hand, then it, it gets a pass for me because, you know, there's nothing more I can I can say. That's that's the end goal. So it's probably fine. But But I've also noticed that like there's many patterns and really I should say common patterns of failure um, across my seven year career working as a software engineer at companies large and small. And that's what we're talking about today with respect to testing. Of note are these common patterns of testing that end up being complex, hard to reason about, and don't scale well for inevitable changing requirements. And worse, when we get to like large scale of companies, code bases, organization size, um, often like length of the company being alive, we often get to like this case where we have thousands of tests, but the system still remains brittle and no one can really understand whether the tested requirements are useful or not. So things like just changing an innocuous change over here, your system like breaks way over here and it's like, well, we have a thousands of tests. We don't know like how did this, you know, hit prod or worse, like we're making a small change over here and this test breaks over here, but it's kind of hard to like understand. So you're like, is this bad? Or like, is this, is this just broken? Do I just change the test? Or does this mean I like broke something important? And so this often happens in these like large code bases um, at large organizations, which basically is just means that you have an untested system with extra steps because the tests aren't adding um, confidence. And so what we're gonna do in this post really is I'm gonna share some observations about testing and some tactics that I found helpful in doing this better at scale to try and avoid some of these common outcomes that seem to plague these like large scale systems. And I'm not saying that like, you know, this is the right way to do things, that you have to do things this way. I'm more saying that I've observed these practices to work better over time than alternatives in more situations. And so I'm sharing this out to hopefully, you know, help people that are in similar situations and also get feedback on things that you found to work so that we can kind of come to a better solution because it's not fun for anybody. It's not useful for the business. It sucks being in teams like this, working on code bases like this. So maybe we can find a solution that's better overall. So anyway, that's the idea. This will probably be a longer one. Um, so feel free to skip around. I'll have the, you know, timestamps everywhere um, and the bottom if you wanna, if you wanna go to different sections. One final plug is if you wanna support this blog and videos like this. I do have new uh, t-shirts, fun t-shirts, like the one I'm wearing right here. Hopefully you can see it in the video. I think you can. Um, now available on Hemi Shop. So if you're interested in that, uh, go check it out. All right, so to start this kind of like testing journey, we really have to start at the basics, which is like, why do we test? Why do we write tests for our software? And I think the goal of a test really is to just make sure that a system does what it's supposed to do. And the reason is that like a system only exists to produce some impact in the outside world. If there was no reason for the system or the system wasn't producing any impact, then really it just shouldn't exist um, because it's not doing anything. And what this means at its core is that what we really care about and by extension, what we need to test, what we need to prove, what we want to make sure doesn't break is that given X inputs to the system, we get Y output. This is the behavior. And we'll dive into this more a little bit, but I kind of want to show like, why is this testing useful for business orgs and engineering teams? Why do we care about the system doing what it's supposed to do? 
And the first is we, you know, we need to make sure that the system follows business rules. So like if we're saying we're going to charge you X dollars and the system charges you Y dollars instead, then that's a problem. If you're a bank, if you're a business or something that's like illegal. So like we want to avoid these things, right? And the only way really to prove that these business rules at scale do what they're supposed to do is to have these automated proofs. That's really what testing is, is automated proofs that the system is following the business rules. It's doing the behavior that it was built to do. Because what we care about at the end of the day is the impact in the outside world. Um, and so really that's what matters. Now, the other thing that makes this useful, especially at larger orgs and larger teams, larger code bases, is that it provides accurate documentation. So aside from proving the system follows the rules, tests also serve as a source of truth for what these rules are. Every large business likely has dozens of documents outlining a single business system, or really a business process. You know, there's probably artifacts from the initial planning phase, and then over the years, it's probably gone through multiple refactors. Um, probably there's like cases for, you know, expanding it to like a new geography and to, to follow like a new um, legal rule or something. And so in the end, we often end up with like dozens of documents outlining the single business system that have like accumulated over the years, but there's no like single source of truth for what this thing does. And even if there is in a wiki or something, at the end of the day, the thing that's actually doing the work, you know, the system that's actually running the business rules is what matters. Because no matter what the wiki says, if the system does something different, then, then it doesn't matter, right? And so, and so at the end of the day, the system is what's actually running the business rules. And so the system must be the source of truth, the actual documentation of what is taking place. Anything else is prone to like divergence, to being stale later. The only thing we can actually trust is the system itself. And finally, something that like businesses care about, engineering teams care about, engineers care about because it's like makes the job more fun is having good tests enables faster and safer changes to systems. So software systems really are just like virtual buildings. You know, they're just building blocks on top of each other and we, we build this large construction of thing. And tests basically prove that the external requirements are still met which allows us to change how the building is constructed without ruining everything inside the building. So, you know, if it was initially built out of sticks, maybe we want to change to bricks or something. Maybe we want to change to steel. Maybe we want to add an elevator. Maybe we want to do this or that. But at the same time, there's still things in the building. The building's still doing stuff. So we got to make sure that like, you know, there's oxygen, there's water, that people can go up and down, that like the foundations are still secure. And if we don't have tests, or we don't have tests that are proving that our system is doing what it's supposed to do well, then it's really easy to accidentally remove the foundation or the roof or stairs or something very important from this construction that we have and not notice it till later because we're not actually proving the things that matter, the end-to-end -end behavior of the system. And so having confidence that a random change somewhere, like I'm changing the stairs from being made out of sticks to bricks, doesn't destroy the building entirely, helps to allow for faster system changes without destroying everything because we have good confidence that if I change something and it breaks the building, we have tests proving that the building still run. Now for a further exploration of the software as a virtual building metaphor, um, I go into like deep detail with respect to types um, in this post so you can learn more there. Now of particular note when it comes to testing and really systems and the usefulness of systems is that the outside world does not care about how an X to Y conversion takes place. It really only cares that it takes place within some expected constraints. Like obviously it probably cares about like how much time it takes, how much it costs to do this thing. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what happens behind the curtain to them. And this makes sense, right? Like let's say there's a vending machine that takes X dollars and gives you Y drink. As a customer, if I pay X dollars, I expect Y drink. I don't really care how that drink gets to me. It just needs to get to me and you know, probably do so fast and like unbroken and ideally like not too shaken up and you know, stuff like that. But it just needs to get to me. I don't really care what's happening inside the vending machine to give me that drink. I just know that the contract is, I give you dollars, you give me drink. And this means that it doesn't matter what the mechanism is to provide the drink. You know, it could be a robot in there. Maybe there's like a little human in there. Maybe there's like a Lovecraftian horror from like another dimension in there. It doesn't matter. It just matters that I paid X dollars and I get the Y drink that I was promised. And this may seem like a minor point, but this is where I see a lot of tests go wrong. They test for the implementation and not the actual behavior of the system. And this often leads to dozens and in large scale systems, hundreds, sometimes thousands of tests for, for a given system that are enforcing that, you know, the robot or the human or the horror is doing something specific, but misses the simple fact 
that what we care about is X dollars turns into Y drink. And so often our system crashes, even though we have these thousands of tests. Moreover, it makes each of these inevitable requirements change harder to make. So if a product decides to go from a robot to a horror, you know, just a simple refactor like this, now all of the tests are broken. And the question is, is the vending machine actually broken though? Now that I've replaced the robot with the horror, can I still get the drink for my dollars? And this is often unclear because first, if we've done all these implementation tests, we have to change all the internal implementation tests to pass and then look at the behavioral tests. Where were the behavioral tests? Often if we're doing implementation tests, they're all kind of like screwed around or doing like a lot of mocks. Um, because we're testing the implementation, so we don't have to test the like end-to-end -end behavior. And then it's like, oh, I can't find those behavioral tests because maybe they're hidden amongst these dozens of implementation tests. And then if you do find them, you're like, wait, are they still testing the right thing? Because in order to get my implementation to work, I just changed dozens of tests so that those now pass, but like, were the changes just implementation or were they behavior? And it gets very confusing very fast. And you know, this is a bit contrived and extreme, but this happens so frequently in the systems that I've seen over the years that frankly, I'm pretty frustrated. We keep doing this to ourselves. And so I really feel like I need to emphasize it. And now to sum up the section, you know, the reason we write tests is to ensure that the system produces the impact it's supposed to, really that it follows the requirements from the business, it follows the requirements from the world because the system is useless if it's not doing that thing. The only reason it exists is to do those requirements. And a system's impact really is its behavior, not its implementation. So to test the impact of a system, we need to be testing its behavior. So this is basically given X, output Y. All right, what does it mean for a test to be scalable? Before we can really talk about this, I kind of need to talk about what do I mean by scalability. And basically I like to build simple scalable systems. And this is for a few reasons. Basically, I believe that if a system is not simple, then it's gonna be hard to reason about and thus hard to maintain and change over time. Change itself is inevitable and most system engineering, really, if we think about it, is maintenance. And so if we build something that is not simple, generally this means a worse system because this makes it hard to do our main job, handle change and maintain the system over time. Now, if a system is not scalable, then it's gonna break when we scale up down our requirements and inevitably inevitably change and change is inevitable. So if the system does not scale, it is not a long-term solution because it can't even handle what it's like built to do, right? Supply that input out what put external impact and that external impact is going to need to change. So if it can't handle that change, like it, it's not an actual good solution for this problem. And if it's not a systemic system, then we really can't reuse the system or its philosophy. So we're doing a lot of one-off work. And, you know, I think doing things that don't scale one-off work is like fine in a lot of cases, but I do think if you're seeing common problems or scenarios like testing software, then it's often useful to invest in a common solution so that you can spend your innovation budget elsewhere. Like why are you reinventing the wheel every time and we can just like use a standard wheel off the rack and then we can use our innovation budget on what actually gives us an edge. Nobody's edge is testing software, okay? So just do the thing that actually works and get on with your life. Okay, and so if the goal of a test is to ensure our system is doing what it's supposed to, the test needs to take a form that it can change along with the system it tests. Ideally, we want the test to require minimal extra effort, um, what I call unnecessary complexity, complexity that is not necessary to like solve the actual thing on top of the primary system to handle these changes while still maintaining correctness. And this is like a big problem, I think, in a lot of large systems is that the testing becomes so complex that we can't even understand what's going on. It's such a chore to even add new tests. Every change requires changing all these implementation tests everywhere. And this is honestly how a lot of systems kind of grind to a halt because to, you know, continue with our test coverage or whatever, we're making all these other auxiliary changes, or we just call, you know, bankruptcy on the tests. And now we're just like building systems with no proof whatsoever. And both end up with a lot of fires and rework, um, which stops you from actually doing the thing you want, which is like, you know, accomplishing that that external impact. And so some very common changes that tests need to scale for, these are like common changes that just happen in day-to-day -day life that like we need to accept is what is going to happen to your system. And it will happen sooner rather than later. Examples of these are like, we need to understand what the current functional functionality is because if you don't understand the state of the world today compared to like where you're trying to go, how are you gonna know like, how are you gonna even make the change to make things better? This is very, very common for like when you start a feature or um, product is planning a new change. They want to know what like the current rules are so that they can like compare it with the new rules. Um, and then after that, it's very common to get new requirements. So this will be like new or different inputs and outputs that your system needs to handle. Another common example of this is new implementation detail changes. So, you know, 
in our vending machine case, maybe you're changing it out from a robot to a horror in the middle of it. Um, but other common ones are like if you're using APIs for something like AI or uh, I don't know, fraud protection, you know, whatever it is, um, you're often going to change from vendor A to vendor B. So, so can our tests easily scale uh, to this? Another common change or thing that we need to provide for to happen is that we'll, we'll have new devs coming in that need to read, um, often change the code, often debug our code to see why their system is doing whatever for the first time. And so for these people, like these inputs, outputs are very crucial for understanding like what does this system do? Um, how do I test if it's doing the new thing? And basically providing them like a pit of success as opposed to like, you know, the default pit of failure. And the last one is just product people trying to understand the existing system. We kind of talked about this already with inputs, outputs, but um, for this one, it's often more about like being super readable um, because product people's requirements are often going to be in different forms, like a spreadsheet or like a, a doc or something than your inputs, outputs. And so the more readable our inputs, outputs are, the easier it is going to be able to compare with the actual like business requirements that are new. And then this kind of flows into all these new changes because whatever the product people decide, you know, that's that's kind of where the system needs to go. And so for real world testing purposes, we have several dimensions of scalability that I think are important to think about when we're trying to handle these like very common scenarios. So the first dimension of this really is like code base size. So the larger the code base is, the less likely a single person understands all the requirements and thus the more important it is for these requirements to be understandable and enforced in code. So like if you are the size of Facebook or Instagram where each of your code bases are like millions of lines of code, it is actually impossible to find any one person who understands how it all fits together. And so the only way we can do this at scale is if that person can ramp up on a new code base relatively easily um, and know that if they make a change here, um, the test should be enforcing the system good enough to make sure that it's not breaking things everywhere else. And at the end of the day, you know, the code itself is the source of truth. We already talked about how you have all these artifacts, but none of them are actually correct. Um, so the more readable it is and, you know, test requirements are documentation, then the better we can scale to these larger code bases, which really just means more systemized requirements. And requirements are what matters at the end of the day because that's the impact we want to have in the real world. The next dimension of scale to talk about is like organization size. And often code base size and organization size go hand in hand, but not always. And basically the larger the org is, the less likely a single person understands the full product or domain requirements. And the more important it is, the code itself acts as a source of truth for docs and enforcement especially like a larger org, often they're doing like more business processes in general. And so you're actually going to have like often more domain things that the system is trying to handle or more domain things that need to be kept in mind when you think about the system. And so like when you think about an engineer actually working on this, it's unlikely they're going to understand all the things that the business needs to do. And yet they're working on the system that handles all this stuff. And so really we need that the code that handles all these business cases to be enforcing that they're doing that for those business cases to prevent these like developers that are coming in with good intentions from accidentally breaking everything. And when we think about like the larger the org is, especially the larger the engineering org is, this often means more people making changes at the same time, you know, um, like a sufficiently large org will have thousands of changes, maybe more that are getting shipped to production every single day. Um, and so it's kind of like surface area of potential error times amount of like people shipping code every day equals the probability of like a change breaking something just by a definition of like the statistics of this is that it's more likely for people to make a seemingly innocuous change with good intentions that break everything if the system itself is not enforcing that it's, it's meeting those business requirements. And the final dimension of scalability that we need to think about and that I think a lot of people like undervalue is the need for requirement change. I think just change is inevitable. And so if you ever build a system that like you're saying, oh, this is fine, it won't need to change later, like you're just wrong. <laughs> like the system will need to change later. Like stop saying that the system is fine because it doesn't change. Like that's, that's just irresponsible, honestly. Um, don't build systems like that. And so if your test cannot easily change with the underlying system, and we know that the underlying system will need to change, then you are making more work for yourself in the future. And you might think that this is like, ah, oh, this is someone else's problem. It's probably going to be your problem. Let's be real. Um, so just build systems that are easy to change. More generally, this often leads to cases where like, if the tests are like hard to add and change with the system, uh, the first case is like, maybe you're not adding new tests. And so, because like, it's hard to set up the data model or whatever. And so you only do a code change, but not a proof change. And this just means that we're adding more unproven business logic, which means that, you know, there's no guarantee that this business logic will even stay in there for like a month. There's no guarantee that it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. And so our system gets like larger and larger with more changes that differ from the requirements we have. Um, and we just don't even know if they're even doing those things. And two, um, 
is where we actually do decide to make more tests. But if we already are writing tests in a non-scalable manner, then it's common for the additional tests to just be slapped on there in the same non-scalable manner. And what this means is we often end up having dozens of tests for a given feature, but no easy way to see what exactly this thing is doing without reading through, understanding the hundreds and thousand lines of test code, setup code, um, assertions and stuff like that. And so it, it's almost like we have so much tests and this is why I hate test code coverage because it doesn't understand this. 100% test coverage, we have you know dozens of tests, thousands of lines of test code and nobody can understand what the system does because the tests are so like ridiculously all over the place in ad hoc. Um, and this is how we get those big systems that like, you know, are super tested, um, but they're, then they're so brittle that random changes break random things everywhere. And so I think these are the big areas of scalability we need to think about um, in order to handle all of these common changes, um, sources of changes in our system. And so here's some strategies that I found that generally help with test scalability, help make your test scale with time, with code base size, with new requirements, with organizations, stuff like that. So the first strategy is to write data-driven tests. So usually, this is gonna mean several test cases that contain inputs and outputs for a given subsystem. This makes it very easy to see what the system's contract is, what it currently does, so it provides a source of truth of documentation, how to add, modify, and remove test cases because we already have the list of test cases there, so you literally just like change the list of requirements, and how to change the contract entirely. So maybe changing input, output, composition, maybe adding, removing properties you wanna check, stuff like that. We already have the format, so it's very clear how you can plug into the system to change things. Another benefit of this is like we know that the system will need to change, and so if you can provide inputs, outputs, and a list of them and run them, this is a better idea that like this function itself is um, composable because it can handle those cases. Um, but that's like not a hard and fast rule, but just something to think about. Now, moreover, this really like these lists of tests helps to avoid what I consider like false tests or like zombie tests um, that often end up in these like large scale systems that have been around for like many years. And these are often tests that like prove one particular scenario of a system that look like they're proving something useful. Often a particular variable leads to a particular outcome when actually they're gonna be load bearing on another variable. This often happens if you have like a um, simple assert test like is is true or is false or something like that and you're just assuming that the variable under test is actually what leads to the outcome when actually it's something else entirely and your test is actually proving nothing at all. And so I find that like forcing multiple test cases helps to prove that this variable is indeed the controlling factor and therefore helps ensure that the test is actually a proof of something useful. And I think of this kind of like a null case in a, in a science experiment where like you need to prove both that without the, the variable changing, nothing happens. And with the variable, something happens in order to actually have a useful experiment. And I, I honestly see these false and zombie tests so often in code bases, especially long ones that have been around for a few years, um, that I would posit it's common for at least 30% of tests to do this. And unfortunately, most of these tests are like one-off. So I'd probably even say like 60 to 70% of test code um, contains these like 30% of zombie tests. All right, so the next strategy I have is to test the behavior of a subsystem, not internal implementations. And like, this is not a hard and fast rule, but like ask yourself if each test is enforcing behavior or if it's enforcing implementation. And sometimes it's useful to test internal implementation if that part itself is a subsystem that would benefit from behavior assertions. Um, these are, might be things like a particularly complex math calculation, or like if you're testing a cache or something, like you should probably have some tests that the cache is doing what it's supposed to, because that kind of affects like the rest of the system, but you know, you might not easily test that in a full behavior test. Um, but generally implementation testing is useless without behavior testing because bugs from system interaction are usually harder to catch and usually what ends up you know, breaking the system. So often you're better off just starting with behavior testing if you're gonna do any testing at all. And I think you know the problem with these implementation testing things that I see is that you can have 100% or even 1000% of code coverage, which is basically just like, you know, you test the same code 10 times or whatever. Um, but if the system behavior is still wrong, then all of that coverage is useless. And this is why I think code coverage is really like a useless metric because it, it doesn't really help us understand if our system is right or not. And I think, and like examples where I see this a lot is where each implementation itself, each internal function or whatever is proven to do what it's doing. You're basically just testing it does what the function says it does. Um, so it works in isolation, 
but we still get our you know end behavior of x dollars to y drink is still broken right and i think this most often happens when we have implicit logic these are things like untyped returns most common in dynamic languages um, we get exception control flow very common in most mainstream languages or we get things that are data mutations um, very common in like object oriented uh, languages or paradigms that happen in real life most often when we have combinations of systems talking to each other and changing each other um, but doesn't occur in isolation because we've removed those external mutations, um, but that's actually not testing reality correctly. And like, you know, aside, this is why I'm so in favor of strong types, um, functional return flows, um, and avoiding mutations at all, because this is like honestly one of the most common sources of bugs and one of the most common sources of making things hard to test. A good rule of thumb um, to see if you're testing like a subsystem behavior or not is to really ask yourself if this is a public API um, or interface of the system that you're building. And if what you're testing is not or should not be used by like end users, an end user can mean like yes, an end-to-end -end customer, but also just like another team that's using your thing as like a library or relying on, on some way, then it's probably an implementation detail. Like if you would not have someone else rely on this thing, then it's not behavior of the system because it's just a way that you've decided to support the actual behavior of the system. And now if it is surfaced, then it is most likely a behavior that users could depend on and thus is probably something useful to test. And I think a lot of people get confused, like they're saying like, oh, so you're saying I shouldn't test like internal or intermediate calculations or something. And it's like, I'm not saying that, I'm saying test the behavior of the system. And so it's possible for you to have like a public API that does something, but also you might provide some um, internal helper functions uh, that you allow other systems to check for debug purposes. Like that is a behavior because you're saying, oh, customers might actually want to use this. Um, but if it's something that you'd be like, customers should never use this, that is absolutely an implementation detail. And so probably shouldn't be tested itself because as soon as you change the implementation, which is inevitable, your test will break, but it's meaningless to the actual system. So don't do that. All right, and the last strategy here um, really is to avoid mocks. So plain and simple, mocks are lies. You want to avoid mocks as much as possible. Mocks do not behave like production systems. So what are you actually testing? You're testing a lie. Every time you use a mock, you are testing another lie. And this leads you to testing more and more lies. And eventually you aren't even testing the system, just a bunch of assumptions. And assumptions are often wrong. So avoid mocks and lies as much as possible when you're doing proofs because you're proving nothing. Now there are some cases where mocks are useful and this is most useful when you're like calling external APIs, especially expensive ones because you don't wanna use your credits on tests. But you should always think critically about whether this mock is helping the test. Usually it, this only helps if you're avoiding irrelevant setup or baggage or like extra costs that are you know, unnecessary. But often this is hurting the test by missing potentially crucial edge and failure cases that you won't see until prod because again, usually it's the combination of subsystems that lead to these bugs, not the actual systems in isolation. And so I'm not saying you should never use mocks, but I am saying you need to always think critically about if this is helping or hurting and usually it's hurting. And especially like if you have more than maybe one mock in a test, you really need to think critically about that because if you're testing like three to five mocks, like basically what what even is left to test here? Like what, what even are you doing? So yeah, avoid mocks. Okay, how to write simple scalable tests. So based on all of these observations, all these problems I've called out, all these strategies to try and like, a, you know, approach solving for them. I've coalesced on a general pattern of testing that I found works well across many scenarios at many dimensional scales large and small, that's what makes it a simple scalable system. Now there are certainly other ways of testing and this will not be the best method in all scenarios, but it is the best simple scalable system that I found for testing thus far and what I use most often. And so I'm gonna share it here because I find it helpful. And so the general layout of my tests, I think a test has three stages and you've probably seen this before. It's like very elementary. It's, you know, in a lot of textbooks. And I, I think this one actually holds true. It has three stages. So the first stage is going to be a range. This is where you set up your data. This will usually be test cases that you want to test, the inputs and any data model and mocks the system requires. And this is in its separate step so that we can like set up the experiment before we actually go on to do the experiment. And this helps keep us, you know, following the scientific method, making sure we're not introducing like stray variables, 
making sure we're actually testing the hypothesis that we, that we came out to prove. Um, so this gets its own. We actually do the action. So we're actually calling the system, the subsystem to see if the behavior is true or not. This is where the mutation comes in. And what I found is, you know, well-designed code, well-designed tests can almost always have the act section be one to few, usually three or less. There's usually should never be more than like three mutations here. Um, assuming that you're testing a subsystem's behavior. And so if you have more than one, and especially more than like a few, like three calls in your act section, you really need to think about why, because this is almost certainly a sign that what you're testing is not actually the behavior of a system and or your system is set up weird that like the behavior is not constrained into a deterministic hole. So just think about that. And then the final act is to assert, right? So like we've, we've arranged our data, um, we've done the act that we're trying to test, and now we need to just like prove our thing check what we expected with what actually happened. And usually this really only comes in two flavors, right? If you have a pure function um, that just does inputs outputs, then we can usually just look at its returns. And then if it's an impure function that's doing some sort of like mutation, like a database um, change or like an external API call or you know whatever it is, then we can look at the expected mutation. So this does work, you know, it's not only for functional, it's not only for pure, it works for impure. You can have a combination of these, um, but I do think it's important to have these three different stages and have them separate. In fact, I even go so far as to comment out these sections in my code because I find it helps keeps tests organized and manageable, which generally helps it remain a clear proof rather than a glob of extra code no one understands. I find a lot of these like large sprawling one like ad hoc tests have like mocks everywhere and they're like doing all sorts of mutations between subtests and it's like impossible to see what is actually being set up what is part of the actual hypothesis what is part of actually just arranging data and where the actual assertion is that matters here um, and then that makes it just a useless proof of requirements because we don't even know what it's testing so i do this you don't have to but i, I highly recommend commenting out these sections and i'll show you an example of this code later as well so if you're testing the behavior of a subsystem, the test body can almost always be pretty short and straightforward. I found this through all sorts of code bases, large and small, that like if you set up your code this way, if you set up your tests this way, the test code itself can usually be less than like 10 or 15 lines. And this is because the behavior itself should be pretty deterministic, right? Like at the end of the day, but the behavior of a system is just given X, do Y, and this is literally just a list of the requirements for the system. And the system requirements like usually just aren't that much. It's the implementation details, the unnecessary complexity that causes all these extra mutations and assertions that are, that are required. But for only testing behavior, it's only inputs to outputs, that's it. If your test is not this straightforward, and probably it won't be if your system hasn't been built this way, um, or your behavior is not deterministic, then you should really think about why is that? What is causing this to happen? And this is often a sign that your system itself is not operating in a simple scalable way and could benefit from a refactor. In many cases, this is due to implicit mutations or dependencies that the system is taking or the system is not modeling the domain effectively. So often I see this happen where like the system is not, it's kind of like technically changed from what, what the domain actually wants. And this often has, it happens if you've got factories on factories, on singletons, on like, you know, builders and whatever. And these are all technical details that like, they're not real. These don't exist in the outside world, but they've made your code and system more complex, which makes your testing of the system more complex. And really the only thing the world cares about is inputs to output. And to kind of like bring this, you know, criticism back to, I guess, first principles, you know, the whole basis of domain driven design is to get systems to more closely resemble the real world that the system is built and modeled for that we can eliminate the unnecessary complexity gaps caused by these conceptual gaps between system and reality. And this is where like, I think object oriented programming and our love of like inheritance and all these like technical features, these don't exist in the outside world. And so the more abstractions you have built this way, often the harder your system is to test because it's so far removed from what the system actually needs to do. And so if your system is hard to test in this manner, it's likely you're not doing some version of domain driven design. It's largely that you have a huge conceptual gap between the system reality. And so it's hard to test, but guess what? Your system's already also probably hard to actually use and is probably not right. Um, so maybe consider a refactor here. If you're interested in more on domain driven design, um, here's the best book I've read on it. I think it's really takes this approach of like how to build software um, that removes these conceptual gaps. 
um, which I think is very useful just from like a philosophical standpoint of making systems that don't suck. Now I want to reiterate that like I'm not really a strong proponent for like TDD or BDD or anything like that, which is like test-driven design, behavior-driven design, stuff like that. I like testing, but I often write my tests after I have a general sense of what my system is going to look like. So I'm more of like a build and then test and then refactor. But I do think that testing itself is super important to do while you're building up your system so that you can check yourself, you know, at every stage to kind of see like, am I even going in the right direction? And I think a crucially like undervalued part of testing is that this is often the first time that your system actually gets used by anyone, right? Like it never was used before, it didn't exist. And now this is the first time anyone's ever going to use that system. And therefore, this means that this test is really the first signal that you can get about how the system actually works end to end. And so if you, the developer of this system, and therefore you're like the worldwide universal de facto expert of this system because you are the one that builds it. If you cannot easily use your system in a test, then you have to expect that it is magnitudes harder for anyone else to actually use this thing successfully in prod. And I think you should just not ignore this signal. It is almost always telling you something useful. And if you can't use the system, no one else can use the system. So you need to change the system because it's probably bad. Okay, so that's my whole rant on the problem of testing, common pitfalls, you know, strategies to help avoid it. Now I wanna show you like, how do I write tests? How do I implement all these strategies into something that I actually use in my code basis? And I'm gonna be using pseudocode here because the code itself actually doesn't matter. Any language can implement this stuff. What really matters is the logical setup. And I think this is similar to like the scientific method, right? Like the scientific method does not prescribe a specific implementation to run an experiment because that would be crazy. There's infinite experiments you can run. Um, so we can't tell you exactly how to run each experiment. But what we can do is provide a framework for how to run experiments, which are tests. Tests are literally experiments proving something, if X then Y, um, to check these inputs and outputs while minimizing noise from external factors. So I'm giving you a framework of how you can set up this thing um, logically so you can avoid all of these pitfalls. And so here I'll, I'll give you some pseudocode um, that's kind of like a structured framework to run your experiments, you know, these tests, and to try and minimize this complexity while maximizing the scalability and correctness of these systems for all these dimensions that we, we talked about. And so this approach is very simple. Basically what we're doing is three things. First, we're providing very clear input output definition of test cases. Products almost always gives you requirements as a list of inputs outputs. If we do this thing, then we need this thing to happen. And so defining our system requirements in a similar fashion helps to reduce the system and reality drift. You know, product never says build a singleton factory, build it, right? That is ridiculous. It doesn't exist. It's just fake, okay? What does exist is we have requirements. Here's the list of requirements. The system needs to do this. So let's model it as such. And then we take these definition of test cases and we're gonna literally turn them into a list of requirements that are enforced via proofs by using data-driven test cases. And so we already have the exact definition of what you know an input output is. Now we just list all of those because that's the exact same thing that the product, the business um, reality needs. And so this helps us so that we can read and understand the current behavior. We can literally just you know go down the list of requirements and make sure everything is in there that that product expects. We also have a very clear structured way to add new test cases, new requirements um, when they inevitably arrive. We can also remove requirements if they've changed. We can modify them to handle these things. You know, make sure that the bug that we just fixed um, is actually not in the system anymore. And we can also have an easy way to change the input and output definitions all in one place. Um, and this keeps the documentation very easy to read. It gives us all the source of truth we need. It scales to all of those different dimensions, new developers, um, changes, uh, new requirements. And so this here really is the core of what we're doing. And then finally, we have, you know, just a simple test body using those clear test steps I showed you earlier, which provides deterministic arrange, act, and assertions across all the test cases. And this is very important for running experiments, okay? So from science class, we learned it's very easy to accidentally introduce external factors that corrupt the outcomes of the experiment by just doing something different. You know, this is the whole idea of like, is this experiment repeatable? Well, if we follow the exact steps, but it's we can't get the same outputs, then probably we have an external variable that we're not testing for. And so in order to prevent the surface area of error in this manner, we need to have all the test cases go through the same simple test body so that we can see all the possible, you know, vectors of new mutations coming into our test case. 
And the truth is like the simpler the test body, the less unknown factors can be introduced. Um, simple has a lot of benefits and one of them is just like the simpler it is, the harder it is to do, get it wrong. And so this avoids the very common issue of false tests or zombie tests that I kind of talked about earlier, where we have dozens of tests each with different setup and teardown. So it's unclear what exactly is being tested, what variables lead to what outcomes and often ends up introducing these auxiliary variables that actually change the whole test and, and render them useless. And so here, here's what that might look like in code, right? You might just have a definition of the test case for your given test. Uh, you should always give it a name to kind of show like, what is the behavior that you're testing? Um, and then you might have like a bunch of inputs that you list. This might be like things to uh, inputs to your function. This might be some data that you want to set up beforehand, like does the user exist or not, or something like that. And then your expected return value. Um, here I have a bool, but often it should be very similar um, to what the actual return of the function is. So you might have like expected return, and then um, for you know systems that use um, exception-based control flow, uh, please don't use exception-based control flow, but a lot of systems do anyway. Um, then you might also have an expect there because that would override the return value. Um, so, you, so you might need to test that as well. But generally the expect is just gonna be like one or two cases. The inputs might be a lot of cases if we have like large cardinality of behavior that we're trying to, trying to test and then always provide a name. And then what you can do is you can build up your requirements here, right? And so now you have a list of all the requirements, all the behavior that your system is supposed to do. And this is also a great place to add in extra information about like why is this test case important? So obviously the name can be here, but like also if you're fixing a bug, this is a great place to like, you know, in the comment section here, be like, this fixes bug, provide the Jira ticket tag, say like why this is important. And then that way when random developer comes in three months later, they don't just like break this test case and assume it's like a, a stupid test case. They know like, oh, this is actually important because it's tied to an actual requirement. And then let's look at the test, right? Like it's very simple. So you might have a test here, you know, every testing uh, framework has this. Then you just loop through all the test cases. Maybe you like log out what the name is that you're doing. And then you arrange your data. You do the act, which usually can be one function, sometimes up to three. Probably you don't need more than three. And then you just assert on everything that you have. It's, it's really that straightforward. And it should be that straightforward for a proofing engine. If it's any more complicated, you gotta wonder if you're actually proving anything or not. And yeah, so this pseudocode can be translated into any programming language with any testing framework. It does not rely on any particular dependencies and it's easy to scale up or down in any dimensional scale. So like really this is how I test basically everything from like a small calculation to like my whole end to end systems. Like it really should be this simple, this organized, um, if you're testing behaviors of system. All right, now let's like reflect a little bit of like, how does this scale in all the dimensions we talked about earlier? So if we have new requirements, what, what do we do with this test? Well, basically we just modify the test cases, right? Maybe we even change the arrange act assert clauses if we have like a new piece of data or something, but frequently, this is not necessary if you're doing data-driven behavioral tests because frequently when you change requirements, all it means is changing the test cases, you know, what inputs lead to what outputs, not actually um, the data or the, the action, you know, clicking the vending machine button um, or what comes out of it. It's usually just like some input output thing. And of course, this also makes this way more scalable because we can basically have one list of requirements for the whole system as opposed to having dozens of tests, you know, testing random things who know who even knows what it's all testing it's impossible to know and it has a scale for like understanding existing requirements which again is useful for like um, organizations at large scales because there's way more people um, who just will not have the context of what the system is supposed to do and this is really good because you just read the test case behavior right all the proofs are all there they're all enforced they're all in one place so it's like if i want to know what my vending machine does i go to the test the vending machine thing and i can see all the inputs and outputs that it requires that's it all right what about like new implementation details right so we're changing like the robot for the horror the horror for the human you know whatever we're doing well we are testing behavior not implementation so if the implementation leads to the same behavior we're good you know as long as you you know, change the robot with the horror and I can still give you X dollars and get Y drink. Who cares? Who cares what the implementation is? It's working. The system works. Now, if you get different behavior, then that's an interesting thing. Like, did you want different behavior for an implementation? Now we have like very high signal that your implementation change also led to behavior change. Now, sometimes this is what you want, but often it's not. But now we get very high signal here because we're not testing implementation details. So we don't get like dozens of failure cases. We know for a fact, this is a behavior change and we can ask ourselves if this is um, expected or not. All right, I know we're going like super long here, 
um, but I wanted to cover like the most common feedback I get when I talk about this. And that is that people say that testing like this is too hard for my system. And I want you to know that like, you don't have to worry, you're not alone. Like this is the most frequent complaint I get when I introduce testing like this to any organization, any team, any single person. Um, it's like, this is crazy, this is too hard, there's no way that this is practical. And I think that this is fair, like it is very hard to test many systems that exist on planet Earth in this manner. And I will also call out, this is likely very different from how you've written many tests in your career. I've seen very, very few tests and my whole career across companies, code bases, et cetera, written in this manner. And so I see you, you're right, your complaint is valid. However, I would argue that this is a red flag for the system under test, not the testing methodology. Because if you cannot test the system, how do we know it's doing what it's supposed to? If we don't know it's doing what it's supposed to, how likely is it that it's actually doing that? And so if it's hard for you to test the system, it's probably even harder for someone else to use that system in production. If we can't use the system correctly in production, then it's likely it will be misused instead. And so if we cannot test that a system does what it's supposed to, we kind of have to assume that it's not. And so if you have a system like this, it might be worth thinking critically about changing it, right? At least thinking critically about why is this testing methodology so hard to use on the system that I have. And I wanna reiterate like the big list of benefits that we get when we build systems that are easy to test. You know, we're more confident that the system actually aligns with the requirements, especially after the thousands of changes land every day. We know that, hey, our system is still doing what it's supposed to. We're more confident about the changes that we make. So we can make these changes faster with less fires and rework. There's less chance that we change something random and it's just like broken somewhere and we don't know until it's production. And now it's like 9 p.m. on a Friday and like we're fighting a fire instead of like having dinner with friends. And we also know that testable systems are almost always more composable. It's easier to use, more flexible for more cases and easier to reuse. If it's hard to use in test, it's hard to use in prod, okay? So we wanna avoid these kinds of systems. And I think what makes systems more testable is often that the components under test are more composable. And this means that the pieces are easier to control via inputs with more deterministic outputs, which also makes this piece easier to use and reuse in other parts of the system. And that's like actually using prod to do whatever the outcome is. And this means that these more testable components are almost always easier to use and reuse in prod, easier to evolve over time, which we know change is inevitable, so it will need to evolve over time. And we can do so with confidence because they're better tested. Each component itself is tested. And so as we put them together, we have a more tested, more robust system. And this really is the root of what makes good software. This is the composition over inheritance argument in a nutshell. This is loose coupling over tight coupling. It all comes down to composability and easy testability is the number one easiest, most effective rule of thumb I can give to really anyone, no matter their experience, no matter what the system is, to check if your system is composable. And in my experience, when you have a good composable system, what it feels like is building with Legos, right? It should feel like snap in, in place. That's what it should be with a good composable system. And I, I think that's something we should you know, strive for. So while we're here, um, I know this is like super long, but uh, you know, you've made it this far, like good on you. Thanks for sticking around. Um, I wanted to provide like just kind of a vision of what the software looks like when, when it's done this way. So when you build easy to test and composable systems, I found that a common pattern emerges. It feels like building with Legos. It feels modular. You can kind of just snap and play and things just kind of work, right? It's almost like a video game. Like it, it feels unreal um, because we're not used to systems being like actually <laughs> modular and reusable like this. But this common pattern emerges with a lot of systems. And that's that you basically have an outside do behavior, which is what the external system wants to do. And then inside you'll have some sort of like arrange the data, make a decision, and then take actions on the decision. And this is essentially the whole functional core imperative shell uh, system design that like is kind of complemented um, and lauded in like many different programming circles. Like I think this is just over time, this pattern emerges of like what software that's relatively simple to maintain looks like. And you get this functional core, which is making the decision. So what decision needs to happen? Direct inputs, outputs with results, and then an imperative shell. So like maybe you have to get some data based on the inputs here, and then maybe you gotta um, actually take actions and decisions because any real system always has mutations in it. Um, but by splitting this up, we get our functional core, which makes the decision, and the imperative shell, which sets up the data to make the decision and then actually does the thing based on the decision. And if we build systems like this, it makes it really easy to test 
Because what we can do is we can test the decision portion with pure input output requirements. This is kind of like the brain of the system. And so even just by testing this, we get a ton of code coverage of like, or behavior coverage of like, what is the system actually doing? And then we just test the imperative shell, which itself is just given decision to mutation. And so we actually have a very thin layer that we need to set up with all this extra data everywhere and testing that the mutations happen. And so it makes these, setting up these tests and actually testing a lot of the behavior very simple um, because we have these like two, two things like this. And this makes it very easy to understand. So the system will just kind of by default bias towards simplicity. And it's easy to change the decision and action you know, the inputs and outputs to new requirements, which makes it scalable across a lot of these dimensions that we care about. And it's easy to test, giving us confidence that our system does what it's supposed to do and is relatively composable, which is a key feature of building solid systems on solid subcomponents. You can imagine that to test the functional core, you just need a list of inputs and outputs. And then basically for the imperative shell, you could just have a list of data that's gonna be set up, um, you know, the inputs, outputs that, that you might expect to get from the decision, or you could even just like mock the decision and take actions and assert that those mutations occur. It's, it's very simple to do the arrange, act, assert um, with a list of requirements and expectations on these two layers. Next, Whew, that was a long one. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for sticking around so far. So I, I wanna reiterate like after this like big rant that there really is no right way to code or build systems. There are always trade-offs, each scenario is different and we're always learning from new experiences. So, you know, whatever we do here, it's just a snapshot in time of our best guess on things and we're gonna learn new things and it'll be different. So here, all I'm doing is sharing patterns that I've observed working with systems that tend to bias towards pits of success across the experiences and scenarios I've been in rather than the common failure cases that I often see in these same systems. But as always, your mileage may vary. Now, question for you is what are your strategies for building and testing systems? As I said at the outset, really the goal of this is to share what I found works best so I can get more feedback from everyone else to see like what works best for them so we can come up with a better system together. Let me know what your best strategies are and stuff so that I can incorporate it more um, in my systems as well. Now, if you like this post, you might also like my career as a software engineer so far. Build a simple result type in Python and why you should use them. And finally, the ham stack, a simple scalable tech stack for building modern web apps fast and cheap. This is my general philosophy for building web apps. Um, in 2024 and probably what I'll be using going forward for quite a while. So that's it for this video. I'll see you in the next one.